So welcome to um, Autistica's inaugural virtual art invention auction, Creative Difference, exploring the link between art and autism. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I'm uh, Professor Jonathan Green. Uh, I'm a trustee of Autistica, a child psychiatrist who has worked with uh, autistic children and families uh, for 30 years plus. Um, I also do research at the University of Manchester into um, autism generally and aut autism interventions. Uh, so I'm delighted to be chairing uh, the proceedings this evening uh, and I'll be introducing um, our fellow panelists in just a minute. So our schedule for the evening is as follows. Our panel discussion will start in a few minutes. I'm going to chair and I'm joined by Sarah Jane Bellwood, who's an artist from the north of England who was diagnosed with autism three years ago at the age of 50. We also have Lizzie Huxley-Jones, an autistic author and editor of STIM, and Jane Elizabeth Bennett, who's a professional printmaker working full-time at the University of Central Lancashire. She's also autistic. Before we start the panel, I'm delighted to share the details of our art auction, which will be going live at eight o'clock this evening. You will have a chance to bid on five different pieces of work from a range of autistic and neurotypical artists, some of whom are sitting on the panel. So I've contributed a drawing. Um, uh, Jane has um, contributed a piece and so has Sarah Jane. Um, Lizzie is our, um, um, not a visual artist, she's an author. So she hasn't contributed to the uh, actual or, um, auction event. So as the evening goes on, please do look at the auction site. And um, my colleagues at Autistica have added the link uh, um, to the site, to the chat section of this event. So please have a look at that. You'll be able to see the artworks um, from us and um, others. Um, and that may influence what you'd like to ask us about. The auction itself will be open for two weeks, closing at 8 p.m. on the 27th of October. And of course, all um, proceeds, um, uh, or most of the proceeds will be going to Autistica to support their work. So this is um, an auction to um, promote the arts um, and to raise funds for Autistica as much as anything. This is also your last chance to buy a ticket for our art prize draw, which is the opportunity to have a 30 minute virtual meeting with our panelist, Jane Bennett, talking all things art, her experiences, and the chance to get some hints and tips. And this will close at 7.30 tonight, and the winner will be announced at the end of the event. The link to buy tickets is also in the chat, so please do that, and you'll have some special time with um, Jane. All proceeds, as I've said, from the auction and rattle will ensure that Autistica can fund vital research to support autistic people who need our help more than ever during these challenging times. And of course, you get a lovely piece of artwork in return. So good luck and happy bid bidding. And I hope you uh, really enjoy this evening's event. So um, on to our panel discussion. At the end of our panel, we'll be spending some time answering your questions. So please submit them to us through the Q&A function along the bottom of your screens through our panel discussion, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. What we wanted to do in our um, discussion with you uh, tonight is just have a dialogue together, really. Um, firstly, about the arts, um, particularly visual art, but also um, uh, uh, writing as well, about how each of us got into um, uh, the art world or, or practicing art in some way in our lives and what that's meant to us. And also the issue of art and autism. For those of us who are autistic, what that might mean to us in our art practice, but also what art might uh, mean for autistic people generally and how it might help and, uh, and be important in, uh, in uh, their lives and community life. So those are our themes. And um, I'm going to introduce the the panelists now and um, just start our discussion to think about um, 
the role of art in our lives. So I'm going to start with Jane, if I may. Um, and Jane suggests that you introduce yourself to um, our audience. Talk a bit about how you got into art and what it means to you in your life, if you would. Okay, so I'm Jane Elizabeth Bennett, and I think in a strange way, I've always been an artist. I think art is the first language that I really kind of learned. So for me, art is a way to speak, it's a way to communicate, it's a way to convey emotion, and they're not always things that I'm fantastic at doing in a kind of neurotypical way. For me, art is a very atypical way of communicating you do it through color you do it through gesture you do it through sound you can be very removed from having a conversation like the piece i've submitted um in pursuit of it's it's about my identity but without having an aesthetic identity without having to have a conversation it's it's something that is removed and still very personal and i think that's what art really means to me as an autistic person is it allows very in-depth and meaningful conversation without having to be that neurotypical person um, so it means the world to me and kind of working in the arts means the world because it's part of my identity so Jane uh, thank, thanks so much that's lovely lovely to hear I'm going to um, suggest that Sarah Jane um, introduces yourself, Sarah Jane, to our audience and talks about art in your life, how it came into your life and how, what it means to you now. Um, my name's Sarah Jane Bellwood and I'm an artist based in Lancaster in the north northwest of England. And like Jane, um, I've always been an artist. Um, I have always, always, always drawn, always, I can't remember not drawing. And for me, it's a way, it's an extension of um, possibly collecting because um, I've always, um, I've always been a solitary person. And as a child, I did a lot of wandering um, and particularly I grew up in Cumbria. So I used to follow the River Eden. I used to find an awful lot of things um, as I was wandering, sort of pieces of moss, um, small stones, twigs, um, dead insects, that type of thing that were treasures to me. And um, as I collected these things, um, I also began to draw them and obsessively draw them in minute detail. And that's, that's still probably what I do today. Although um, I do a lot of, I, I paint um, with um, a triple zero brush in oil, watercolors and acrylic but mainly oil paint and watercolor but um it's it's less about communicating for me more about um obsessively reproducing and um making um paintings of the things that i find yeah thanks sarah jane uh, very much so going to come to um lizzie now um lizzie if you'd like to uh introduce yourself to us and talk about how you started writing and what that means to you. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I had to move my mic away because I've got a cup of tea on the same table and it's just, it's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, so if all the sound goes, that's why I've dunked it. Um, so I used to write all the time as a child. I also was very, very solitary. I grew up in rural Wales. So <laughs> wandering around in the forest was basically all I did other than um, reading and writing. And then I went and became an ecologist for a bit. And I was actually a research diver working in the Philippines. And then I had to give that up due to ill health. And I thought, well, what, what are the other things that I'm good at? And I was like, well, I really, love writing and after a couple of more um strange job choices i ended up in book selling and setting up eventually my own freelance editing business working on my manuscripts um with the aim of becoming a children's author um and when i was 
I got diagnosed when I was 27 and I'm 32 now and sort of in the middle of that process in rediscovering art I also discovered that I was autistic and so I started looking for myself in the pages I started looking for myself in books because um Matilda was probably the closest that I've ever got and I was like there must there's got to be more now you know I'm considerably older than when I read Matilda um I kept finding these presentations or characters that were supposed to be autistic who just didn't feel like the autistic people that I know and love. I know so many autistic people and they are passionate, wonderful, fizzing people. And I just never felt that these characters were always the same. And so I kind of got a bit frustrated by this limited representation of uh, autistic people in literature. And that's sort of how STEM came about. Cause I was like, I know so many fantastic creative autistic people and I want to show that off um which is how STEM eventually <laughs> happened um yeah um it's art is important to me because in slightly different way from you guys I suppose it's given me a job and a almost kind of a purpose and a home and a freedom to tell stories that happen to feature autistic children which hopefully will make it onto a bookshelf eventually but until then I've, I've published two books this year so I'm hopefully on a roll <laughs> but we will see. <laughs> oh, lovely good for you Lizzie so um, so I'll say a little bit uh, for me it's interesting that um, uh, all everyone who's talked all of you have um, you know, basically said you were always an artist that, that right from well you could earliest remember you you've been uh, an artist and I mean of course many children are like that what's um, in fact probably all children are artists if you think of most six-year-olds my goodness they communicate through painting drawing you know um, and so one of the interesting thing is why is why people stop um, you know rather than <laughs> Uh, and we obviously, none of us have stopped. We've all kept going, as it were. I, and I did. I actually did for a while. And I think that that fear of coming back to it prevents a lot of people from, yeah. from giving themselves permission. I think that's a big part of being an artist if you've not carried on with art all the way through every step. Because for me, it became a case of I couldn't afford to. And then I, I went off and did science. So um sometimes part of being an artist in adulthood is that giving self permission which is complicated and interesting but difficult <laughs> yeah that it's really interesting what you say there i mean for me i remember basically painting importantly for me from about 10 and um and as a teenager um, I found painting and drawing a kind of, um, it was the most real thing that I experienced just about. When I was, I remember very well in the um, art school or the, you know, the art class in my school, doing a drawing of a plant, uh, a very detailed one. I've still got it actually, very detailed drawing. And I was totally absorbed in doing this drawing. It's like nothing else existed except what I was doing. And I, I came out of it an hour or two later or something. And I, I think I felt that's the most real thing that's happened to me for a long time is that connection with that plant through drawing. And I think that for me, why I held on to it was that it felt, it gave me an access to something that was so real. Um, and um, it's true, a lot of people paint, draw, write during their childhoods but then stop or they lose confidence or whatever um and I think I don't know what it is that kept me going with it because I you know studied medicine and I thought no I just I don't want to just do medicine you know I want to I want to keep doing this as well I don't want to give it up um, and I, that's what I've tried to do is keep going with it um, but I think that's the thing that it's kept on doing for me it's 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 allowed me to feel um really real really real and you've all talked about um uh you know what it does for you personally like it's not about necessarily communicating initially it's about 
something that happens inside you. And that's true for me as well. It just feels real to me. But then, of course, there is a communication part because you you show your stuff to someone. They like it. They buy it. If you're Lizzie, you've published it. Um, and I've had some exhibitions. I think Sarah Jane, I know, has had some exhibitions and uh, and probably Jane, probably all of you have. But And that sharing it is a whole new dimension then. It's like that's an interesting different thing but I think it starts with something very internal um, and as I say for me it was just what what's real and um, I wonder for others of you what it it really means for you in your own you know deep lives as it were it really intimately as it were I think it is, a, for me, fundamentally, it is, it's a method of communicating and without having art and without exhibiting and without those conversations, then I kind of don't see the point that is my, my way of being in the world. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's really important. Um, but I'm seeing like a couple of comments about, you know, what, what kind of stops people or what kind of makes people go and, and working in the arts. And to be honest, working in the arts is incredibly difficult. Um, it's very rewarding, but it's very difficult. Um, and seeing just kind of things about how, you know, how do you kind of work with um, changing client needs and things like that. Working in the arts is work. Um, it's, I was, me and Sarah were speaking briefly before about, there's a kind of romantic notion. If if you are an artist, you are going to be a self-employed. You're going to be doing the accounts. You're going to be doing the website. You're going to be be writing contracts. Um, you know, so you you deal with the kind of changing needs of clients by any any way a freelance person would work is if someone wants to buy your work or wants to commission you, you are kind of in a contract. So it's kind of um, I think there is a romanticism with the art world that we love it so much and we are so committed that we just kind of, we just do it. But the word work is, is very much within there and it's not kind of a nine to five job that you kind of switch on and switch off from. If you're in that creative flow, you might be working all night and then going to a day job and then kind of <laughs> um, commuting and working out how you're gonna ship your work and frame your work and what you can claim back on your taxes. It's, it's very all encompassing, which can be very fantastic. And I, I love that element of it, but also it can be very big um, and network building is very important within that. So I'm very lucky mm. I've, I did, I went all the way through. Um, so I did my kind of school artwork and my A-levels, and then I did a degree in drawing, and then I moved into printmaking, and I've, I've taught printmaking all over the world. Um, and then I did a master's degree, and then I worked in retail for nearly 13 years during that. So I was working visual merchandising in store design, which was fantastic, but very stressful. And now I've kind of moved, I quit my job. I walked away from that because I got my diagnosis of autistic and I thought life's not worth it for the pressure I'm under. And I went back and now I work in a university environment. Um, but it is, it is difficult. It is really a job and you will get good feedback and you will get negative feedback as well. It's, mm. I wish I could be really romantic with that and say it's all <laughs> magic. Um, no, no, I, I, I bow to each of you because I, you know, I, I'm much more amateur than that. But, uh, you know, I totally understand that. My wife's a professional artist, as it happens. So I see that, you know, from her. And you, Sarah Jane, I know you, you're you um, in a university environment, I think, too, aren't you? Uh, how, how is it for you? Well, I wasn't. I, I taught. I haven't taught for 10 years now. I was a painting okay. tutor at um, St. Martin's in, um, at Lancaster. Um, sadly, um, the whole department closed about, well, about 10 years ago. And during that time, I was also, I set up a private gallery and I was, I was running that and um, taking an ironing to make ends meet. And, um, but, you know, sort of getting back to why do people leave um, drawing and, and painting? I, I never did. 
and even when I had no space and I had three small children, all three are autistic, one um, one's, um, struggles more than the others, and single mum, and even through doing all of that, the drawing and painting is such an obsession and you have to be completely and utterly driven to carry on with it because if you weren't driven and you weren't obsessed then you would stop because it is difficult and you are working through the night sometimes and you know trying to you know keep all those plates spinning and do children's homework and you know washing and cooking and all of those things and so I, I, I used to carry I used to make teeny tiny little um, sketchbooks and keep them in the match box in my handbag with a tiny stub of a pencil and a dead bee or a fly or something else so that if I was waiting in the car for a child to come out of cubs or school etc I could do a little bit of work on it and I didn't have a studio then and you, you know but you, 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 just, you just have to be completely and utterly driven and obsessed by what you're doing and I, I think about my practice as an artist all the time you know, when I'm not doing anything else, it's just going through my head the whole time. I'm sort of thinking, you know, I want to be painting that and I want to be painting this and I'm having ideas about what I want to do with the paper next, whether I want it to be black or whether I want the painting, the paper to be white or, you know, is it going to be oil or is it, you know, and it's, it's a continual, continual thing. Mm. And really, yeah, I hear that the, the, the commitment that, uh, to this life, which is hard, as, as uh, Jane says often, and uh, but it's not uh, sort of a commitment, it's an obsession and being driven. And yeah. you, you don't have a choice, you're kind of compelled forward and you're, you're compelled to draw. You, you don't, you can't not. So, if we if we turn to the sort of second theme that I was setting out, uh, which is kind of about the relation of art and autism, if we could put it like that. And uh, I mean, obviously, Lizzie, you've done um, quite a lot of, it sounds like quite a lot of writing work addressing that issue. And I wondered if you'd like to talk about that, um, how art might be particularly helpful for autistics or just, in, I don't know, whatever theme, whether it's art into autism, autism into art, whichever way around you thought would be important. Well, I think ultimately literature is about empathy. It's about walking a mile in someone's shoes. And I think that one of the problems that autistic people like ourselves have is that we often don't get very much empathy from non-autistic people. And I think that actually, from a very functional point of view, writing and literature can be an art, as all types of art, can be a perfect opportunity to have that conversation to have that this is what it feels like to be me this is what I experience that's kind of part of the uh, reason I started stim I've got a copy here um, we have a very nice extremely stimmy cover which I'm very pleased about um, and so when I when I started stim I, I didn't want people to feel prescribed that they had to talk about autism and yet every piece produced by the 18 people in this book is about autism some way or another some of it's through fiction some of it's through illustration some of it's through straight essays some of it's through more creative non-fiction so it feels on the page in very different ways but I think the important thing about it is that people are able to communicate the way they feel and what matters to them and how they experience things. And I think that for mm. other people, they can then come and see that, but also be entertained and enjoy the art and be impressed by it because that's ultimately what I wanted to do. I wanted to showcase how many amazingly talented autistic people that I know who work across so many different mediums. Um, and I think that's a success of the book. <laughs> um, mm. But, um, you know, it doesn't always have say, to be so functional. <laughs> and would you say, Lizzie, that the particular characteristics of autistic art, if I could put it like that, or art made by autistic people, are there, or is it just self-expression generally, which we we would all do as so we would like all to do? I think it 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 differs as much as all other type of art. You know, like 
our individual personalities and experiences and the way we express ourselves gets into every bit of art. I do notice certain things that autistic authors and artists tend to do more because I I've worked with quite a few now and it's um there's always more um how do I describe it sensory like all the senses are there on the page all the time it's very rich everything feels like you're walking through it and so I often read something and be like oh this is this is very much about senses and then I'll check and I'll be like yep autistic <laughs> and it's like so there's some things that you you do see and I think that is simply because of how we experience things as autistic people you know a lot of us have sensory processing disorder with or um synesthesia um both of which I have although synesthesia it, not not con too bad but um they affect how you experience the world and how you write about it and express it and so it comes through the work so I, I do notice that <laughs> um which I think makes the work joyful and really um immersive and powerful mm. and I think um I really think that some of our greatest writers are almost certainly autistic and the problem is the publishing world isn't always the kindest easiest place for autistic people to work within because um so much of it is about ex you're kind of expected to know things and um it's all kind of mysterious from the outside like no one really likes to talk about how it works because it, it works just about <laughs> um but hopefully that with every chip away at the iceberg that autistic people make and every, you know, we elbow our ways into the literature world, we're making space for ourselves and for representation, but also for the space to write about things that aren't about autism, like, because there's so many people who are autistic who don't want to create work that's specifically about autistic people and I think that's an important step like we should have the space within an industry to create whatever we want um so I think mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered your question I get very impassioned no, about it and then just no, you gesture did. a lot <laughs> no, it's fantastic and I wonder what uh, Jane or Sarah Jane you feel about what Liz has said in the visual art field about uh, uh, yeah I mean I think it was so funny when when you were saying a moment ago um, about kind of sensory things. So when I did my, my master's degree, I ended up working um, in theatre spaces with um, sensors and with lighting and sound and animation. And people would trigger various things in the room and that would have different audio and kind of sonic responses and different things would light up and you would have this experience. And then when in 2016, when I when I finally got my diagnosis, I was talking with this therapist about um, sensory problems and things. And she just went, you, you do realise, I think your entire MA was about being, you know, having sensory overload in autism. And I was kind of going, no, of course it's not. Like, why? No. So I think it does kind of like come out. I mean, the piece that I made for my master's wasn't about autism. It wasn't really about sensory awareness. It was about philosophy. Um, but the way that it kind of manifested, looking back, it it is, a, in, a, in a strange way, it kind of relates to what you were saying about autism and the way that these artworks manifest themselves. So I think it's very important that as an artistic, like I, I you know, I hope to move into research in the future as an artistic researcher and as an autistic artist, it's very important to have that space to make work which isn't about autism. Just because I'm autistic doesn't mean I have to be like the voice of autism. But I think my autism, just like as a personality or a writing style, is going to be inherent within the work that I make. You know. The way I describe it is we experience everything autistically, so why wouldn't everything we create be a little bit autistic as well? Sure. Sarah-Jane, what do you yeah, feel? I think, I think a lot of my work is, is more about creating order and laying things out in patterns and then um, um, painting that obsessively. Um, and I, I have sensory overload in a major way. I can't stand sound and light, and it, it's... Um, 
it triggers pain. So I tend to stay away from loud. And so I, I, I really like, I mean, in, I, I just love being at home by myself painting and, um, you know, very quietly getting on and researching um, insects, etc. I'm um, desperately interested in moths at the moment. So I'm obsessively collecting facts about moths and images of moths and um, looking at how they um, interact with and um, pollinate all of our um, native wild orchids, which are another passion of mine. So it's been um, wonderful finding this link. Um, mm. So, yes. Yeah, so. I think for me, um, making art or the process of making art does help me make sense of things or sort my mind out in some way. And um, uh, I always feel more uh, kind of in harmony after I've been making art in my, internally, you know, it's, uh, kind of rebalanced or something like that. And I wondered for, for those of you who have, you know, for whom the world is um, often pretty overwhelming, uh, sen in a sensory sense, whether the art has a function of really trying to help you manage that kind of experience of the of physical and the human world. Um, I don't think so for me, but it's a very internalized process that's um, very much part of research. And um, so I, I do an awful lot of reading and um, alongside of the painting. Um, but I suppose one of the things that it does do is that it, it allows me, um, a, I, I like strict routine. So I'm very typical of an autistic person in that it, it allows, it gives me a huge structure to my entire life and it provides a framework um, for, to exist within really. Um, but mm. it, it doesn't really, it's not something, it, it's my job. Um, it's my place of work and um, it's, you know, as, as Jane was saying earlier, um, it's, 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 a, it's, it's my job as well as something that I'm, I'm um, obsessed with. So, yeah, great, great to hear. So uh, I wondered if we could go to some questions which will stimulate some more thoughts from you, I think, and us all. So there's a question here from Liz, um, which I'm just going to pick out. So Liz says, I've only recently realized I can paint quite well but I struggle with a huge fear of failure when a piece isn't going how I'd like it to be, uh, or I compare it with other people's pieces. Is that something you can relate to? And do you have any yeah. tips for overcoming the fear? And maybe Pictures Liz is- look awful up, until, sorry, <laughs> thinking, they, they look awful until putting up the top one of the reason hill. why a lot of people give up. Um, but uh, what do we feel about the, 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 the sense of being, yeah, failure or, or not it looking a mess or something. I'm obsessed with failure. I'm, I love it. I love the idea of failure. Um, maybe I'm like in an abusive relationship with it. I'm not sure. But basically, whatever you paint or whatever you draw is always going to be a failure on some level because it isn't the real thing. Like witnessing a sunset and painting a sunset aren't comparable. So of course it's going to be a failure give up this notion of failure and fall in love with the process because painting a sunset isn't a sunset. Painting a moth isn't a moth. Sarah's paintings are stunning because they're Sarah's paintings, not because it's a, a moth. Give up this idea of failure and fall in love with it. I, I do burn a lot of my work though. <laughs> So a lot of the time, sometimes you reach a point with a painting where it, it is a painting. Jane's right, it's not a moth, it's not a bee, it's not, you know, it's a painting. But sometimes there's just no rescuing it and you just think, OK, start again. Yeah. And I do that. I start completely over again. And um, it's there's an artist who um, makes work so tiny that it can be put on the top of a, it can be put on the head of a pin. It's Willard, I can't remember his surname. And he wants, he works on his sculptures for about six months. And one of them, he was 
I think he was making Elvis on the on the, on a pinhead, and he breathed in halfway through and just in, inhaled Elvis um, six months of his work. And he said, OK, right, start again. So I always sort of think about him when something goes drastically wrong and it's not working. I just think, yeah, OK, at least I haven't. This isn't six months of work. But a lot of painting looks dreadful until it reaches a certain point and then it starts to come together. And it's like running up a hill. You're running up, you're running up and you're losing the will to live. And then you get to the top of the hill and you, you sort of turn a corner and you, there's this amazing view and it's all downhill from there. And you're what well, that's the part that's the most enjoyable that I call polishing. And you're sort of polishing this painting. And um, but painting is hard work. It's it's not a tiring yeah. painting. I mean, I think I think there's this idea that again, it's we fall in love with these processes like yeah. writing and editing is tiring and painting is tiring and printmaking, like for me, physically is it's tiring <laughs> it's it's an artwork like work work is in there yeah I, but i wonder um how much um having some sense of um uh pleasure from others or or, or praise or something like this early on is helpful uh, so richard Richard Ibbotson right, asked a question here, which maybe relates to that, which is, how does the viewer impact on your work? I.e., would your art be any different if no one was ever going to see it? Uh, Lizzie, would you like to comment on that? Um, I think mine's a bit different just because I'm not a visual artist. And That's true. The, <laughs> my, my manuscripts are still in the uh, writing and drafting and about to do the editing process, just to go back to Liz very, very quickly. Don't compare your things to finished drafts because that might be the 18th painting of that exact one. That might be the 40th draft of a book. You will never know, but first drafts are supposed to be bad. You've got to get your idea on the page and carve it so that it looks like what the idea is. There's always the idea of, the thing you want to create and what you create. And they're not always the same thing, but the editing and the shaping is what matches them up. Um, for me, my intention is that it will always be viewed. Um, I write for children predominantly. Um, I am working on two manuscripts at the moment, one for nine to 12 year olds and one for teenagers. Neither of them have sold yet because I haven't finished them. Um, but the intention is I want to create a dialogue with young children, particularly young autistic children and give them characters that they can see and recognize and go on adventures that aren't about them necessarily being autistic. They're about them going off and fighting monsters and going into other worlds and having relationships. So for me, when I'm writing, I'm always thinking about um, the viewer, which is very hard when you're in a first draft stage. You kind of have to block them out and wait until you're in an editing point of view to be like, okay, well, what will they take from this? What will they understand from what I've said from this? What do they think this means within that context? So for me, um, just because my art is very much my job and my intention is to have these conversations particularly with children um that is definitely on my mind often I have to block it out <laughs> to be like oh I don't want to think about it but um yeah it I suppose it does change it in a way so perhaps um I'm aware we perhaps are starting to slightly run over time but just um, maybe ask Jane if you how about if no one saw your work would that matter is it just solely for you? Do you what do you think about that? If I was going to see it, then I wouldn't have to think about framing it and shipping it. So maybe it would be bigger. Um, I think the I think there's a couple of things about you know failure and people not liking it. There's seven billion people in the world. Not everyone's going to like it, and the worst critic you're ever going to meet is yourself. You are going to think the worst thoughts about yourself and your own artwork, and you're going to see and think things that no one else is ever going to see and think. Um, I've had some criticism of my work in a couple of exhibitions. You know, I, I mean, I've been exhibiting for like a long time. Not everyone's going to like it, and that's fine. I mean, 
it's not for, I'm not for everyone it's not for everyone what fundamentally matters is that I've made it and it's my expression and it's my speech and if you don't like it like go and go and find something else to like like there's life is too short in my opinion to worry about the negatives I, I try and look at the the positives I've had some beautiful feedback I've had some great conversations I've had people buy my work and enjoy it and that is important to me and even if that's just one person that likes my work or even if that person who likes the work is just me and no one ever sees it I think that's a worthwhile that's my time spent worthwhile for my own enjoyment you know, like we were saying, if you can get pleasure out of making something and you can have that moment with yourself and you can have that kind of creative feel, if that's enough for you, then it's enough. If you want to get it out there into the world, do it and do it and be passionate about it. But don't be embarrassed and and remember that it's a conversation and not all, all conversations are kind of like I'm doing now, it's not a fully formed thought, it's not a fully formed sentence, but the more you do it, the more you will communicate. And if you want kind of positive networks, there are positive networks um, to communicate with. Like I'm sure everyone on this panel would be happy, you know, in the future to look at work and share work and have these conversations. And, and I think that's what's important is having the conversations and sharing the work and having the dialogue. Um, is more important than whether everybody likes it. Mm. But um, you you sound like you're very confident in what you do. I guess not everyone is as confident as that. And um, um, so I'd just like to speak up for the um, the kind of importance of other people really looking at stuff or reading if it's if it's something of Lizzie's and. Um, and responding. I find when I show my work and someone really looks at it and responds, that's just thrilling, actually. It's like, and it's rather different to the process of doing it for yourself and with yourself, but there's some sort of, my God, someone else looked at that and they saw something in it. That's amazing. It's, it's kind of thrilling, you know? So, so I, I do think that it, we're lucky if we've had enough kind of positive stuff around us or enough internal drive like Sarah Jane has obviously got to give us the confidence, you know, to keep going. I'm still back in a way with the first question, which is why people stop, you know, cause it's, uh, you know, it's such a good thing. Um, so um, yeah, um, I'm looking here at a question from Sam and um, yeah, I think this is, uh, Sam brings up this notion of flow and I really love this idea. And I wonder we could talk a little bit about this maybe in our own different ways that Sam says it's the feeling of immersion or flow by doing something you love important for your mental well-being. I'm currently doing a PhD about the importance of friendship to autistic people and have come across the writings of Julian, Judith Martinovich, um, who suggested that creative outlets for autistic people is a great source of self-esteem, resilience and positive identity. Um, are you are your personal experiences and attitudes that do, do they agree with that i think well a lot of times when i talk with autistic people uh, but actually non-autistic people too i think this notion of flow is just a crucial thing you just feel you're in the universe really just moving with it in a harm in a kind of a really thrilling way um i wonder if you, any of you guys have that sense of the flow when you're in it yeah, I, I really do. Um, yesterday I had a, a brilliant day. Going back to what Jane was saying about how art as a job is weird. Yesterday I did a pitch for a book, did my self-assessment tax return and sent like 18 emails and then also got into the flow and I wrote 4,000 words of three chapters that I've been brewing in my head for ages and it was intense. They were They're all the sad chapters. You know, like... If you think of a book in terms of like the original Star Wars trilogy, it's that I was at the point of the end of Empire Strikes Back where everything goes wrong and everyone's separated and sad. And so I just spent like 
three hours writing and crying my eyes out and it was a it was sad but also intense and thrilling and it can be amazing nothing feels like that and I I know the difference because I got hired earlier this year to do um a children's book about David Attenborough which is non-fiction and I tell you writing non-fiction does not have the same feeling of flow I was constantly looking for it and I was like churning out a thousand words a day like come on let's get some flow and I'd get it maybe for like 300 words and then be like oh, I've got to look something up so um and I loved writing it and as you were saying about the the wonder of people reading it I've had kids tell me that they've read it and loved it and that was like oh I did something great it was wonderful um but yeah like it is amazing it's I try not to rely on it because I think if you become too reliant on flow being a professional artist is difficult because sometimes you just have to turn up and be like Do you know what today is a day where I write 200 words and they're 200 words I'm gonna delete tomorrow because they're absolutely rubbish but um sometimes you just have to push past and know that you will have the good flow times and you know to really enjoy them when they come in but sometimes you also just have to accept that it's a you know it's a bullet point day <laughs> which is what I would say to the people I was editing I was like if you can't get it out put it in bullet points like that's good enough for a, getting your ideas going sometimes yeah okay well we're out of time really and um <laughs> But I, I must say, I, I, it's been lovely talking to the three of you. And um, um, I hope that the audience has felt kind of inspired um, and enthused as much as I feel just um, being on the call with you. Um, and I'm hope, I guess that they'll have an opportunity. You must all have um, contact details and stuff. If people would like to contact you separately, I guess that would be, you'd be all fine for that. Um, Am I uh, right? Yes, social yeah. media. I'm on Instagram if anyone, anyone wants yeah. to say so, that. And I'm sure, we'll, you know, the, the organizers would be able to circulate some contacts. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so nice to talk to you. And, um, and I hope the audience felt, felt uh, the same about it. Um, but we, we're out of time for that. And we're going to have to move on now to the next um, uh, um, thing in this evening. Uh, which is our um, the auction. So um, I'm really uh, excited to announce that the art auction is about to go live at eight o'clock. Um, so uh, we've got five well uh, wonderful pieces. Well, I, I can't say that about my own, but anyway, uh, apart from mine, five wonderful pieces up for auction from five different artists, um, including, as I've already said, a drawing from myself, um, a um, but work from Sarah Jane and Jane, who you've heard about, and also my my own um, uh, partner wife Ariella, who is a textile artist um, professionally, and she's also contributed to work. So there's five works there. I hope you've already had a ch had a chance to look at them on the on the web on the on the auction site, and there are also some nice videos I think where each of us talks a bit about. Um, the work quite briefly, but it's a nice to get a feel for our voices in that. So they've all been kindly donated by the artist to support Autistica's work, vital work. There are a real range of pieces and styles, so I'm sure there'll be something to suit everyone's tastes. The link to browse the pieces or place a bid is in the chat section of the event, so please take a look. The auction itself will be live for two weeks, closing at 8 p.m. on the 27th of October. So please pass on details to anyone else you know that may be interested. Um, obviously, the higher the bids go for each of the pieces, the more money Autistica will get out of this. And as artists, we are supporting the auction because we believe in the difference that research can make to autistic people's lives. So uh, hope so much you have fun doing that and looking at the artworks, happy bidding. My colleague from Autistica will now show a short video. Creative Difference celebrates the link between autism and creativity. We're hosting a webinar and an online art auction, all in aid of autism research. 
inspired by thinking about the people who make our clothing. It's all really, I suppose, asking the viewer to contemplate where their clothing comes from. I love both painting and drawing, but particularly when I'm drawing, it's as if I have a conversation, a dialogue with the subject I'm looking at. The thing I like to paint most is detail, lots of fine detail. I see in human figures a lot of expression and when they move their bodies I see them trying to reach towards each other to express themselves. The print is a self-portrait. It's about my breath and my breathing. It's quite an atypical expression of self. Browse their unique work now and place a bid and help us to make more of a difference for every autistic person. So thanks, thank you all so much for joining us this evening for our for the art panel discussion. Um, as we've mentioned, there's still time to bid on the artwork and the auction closes on the 27th of October. Um, I want to thank uh, very much my wonderful panelists for taking part this evening. Um, your insight and personal stories have been just wonderful to hear. And I think some of the chat um, uh, just in the last few minutes, I think has suggested that um, lots of the audience felt the same. So that's lovely. Goodbye, everyone. Lovely uh, to meet you all. And um, yeah, happy bidding. <laughs>